So today, um, we're privileged to be talking with Marta Macalusa. Um, she's a dental hygienist, and she's also a myofunctional therapist. She's on the faculty of New York University College of Dentistry, and her private clinic is Manhattan Myofunctional Therapy. Now, we're going to be talking today about the consequences of having a restricted frenum. And I'm going to pass you over to Marta. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick. It's an honor to be here with you. And uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking about some of the consequences um, that come along with having restricted frenums. So first, I would like to begin with the definition of the frenums. So what is a frenum? A frenum is a membranous fold of skin or mucous membrane that supports or restricts, now that's very important to note, it supports or restricts the movement of a part or organ, such as the small band of tissue that connects the underside of the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Now, there are seven frenums inside of our mouth. Some of them, oops, don't know what happened there. <laughs> Sorry. There we go, back. <laughs> so there are seven frenums in our mouth. So beginning with the first frenum, which you can see on the picture, um, it's the maxillary labial frenum, which is the one on the upper lip, on the underside of the upper lip. You have the labial uh, frenum on the mandibular, okay, which is on the underside of your bottom lip. You have the two, you have one, two, three, and four buccal frenums. And you also have the frenum that's on the underside of the tongue, which is called the lingual frenum. Now, ankyloglossia, which is, um, is also known as a tongue tie, is a congenital oral anomaly that may decrease the mobility of the tongue tip and is caused by an unusually short, thick lingual frenulum. So a membrane connecting the underside of the tongue to the floor of the mouth. So now, it's important to address these frenums because there's a lot of cascading oral and health effects that come along with them. So there are different types of restrictions. There are different grades of restrictions. So over the years, they have actually uh, developed various protocols, such as the tongue tie assessment protocol that was developed by Carmen Fernando in the 80s, a pathological consideration of ankyloglossia in lingual myoplasty by Suk Kun Lee, in 1989, the assessment tool for lingual frenulum function designed by uh, Hazel Baker in 1993. We also have the ankyloglossia or tongue tie, a diagnostic and treatment quandary by Kotlow in 1999. And most recently, the lingual frenulum protocol with scores for infants and also for adults uh, by Marcus Nahn and Martinelli um, in 2012. So these are just some of the protocols that have been developed over the years in order to be able to assess the frenums accordingly. Now, why does this happen? So it is said that insufficient apoptosis during prenatal differentiation of the tongue from the floor of the mouth. The cells that attach the tongue to the floor of the mouth normally regress from anterior to posterior leaving a small remnant of attachment called a lingual frenulum. So this actually was taken from a really good book um, titled The Tongue Tie, Morphogenesis, Impact, Assessment, and Treatment by Allison Hazelbaker. So if you're interested in learning more about these uh, uh, restrictions, these lingual frenums, this is an excellent book to uh, go out and get, actually. You'll get a lot of information about it. But we still need to also take into consideration some of these factors. So we need more research. That's the bottom line. You know, I mean, it can be, you know, passed, uh, these restrictions can be passed over from generation to generation. And also it can have something to do perhaps when the mother is pregnant, if she's consuming any drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, during the time that the tongue is developing, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, also allergens or our environment and our diet. So these are some things that have to be taken into consideration as well. I mean, our diet now has been changed uh, so much over the years. I mean, we have a lot of processed foods out there now, a lot of sugars and all these dyes and 
chemicals that are being put into the diet may also play some sort of role in these type of restrictions. I mean, not to mention your overall health as well, but I feel that more research needs to be done uh, in these uh, areas here to try to see what's really contributing to these restrictions. Because we're seeing, it seems that we're just seeing a lot more and more of these restrictions over the years. So a restricted frenum leads to a downward spiral of detrimental health effects. So there's a lot of things that can be associated with these restrictions. You know, not just oral health, but your overall health. And this is just a study here. It was a longitudinal study of the anatomical characteristics of the lingual frenulum in comparison to literature. This was a study done to show that if you're born with a restricted lingual frenulum, okay, so if the tongue is restricted, you will always have that restriction until the age of 99, et cetera. So the frenum does not stretch, it does not, uh, you don't outgrow having a restricted frenum, you will always have a restricted frenum. That's why it's important to address these frenums as early as possible to prevent any um, of these oral and overall health effects that are associated with them. Now, this is another study. This one uh, states a frequent phenotype for pediatric sleep apnea short lingual frenulum. So this study shows that a short lingual frenulum has been associated with difficulties in sucking, swallowing, and speech. Oral dysfunction induced by a short lingual frenulum can lead to oral facial dysmorphosis, dysmorphosis, which decreases the size of upper airway support, increasing the risk of upper airway collapsibility during sleep. And a short lingual frenulum left untreated at birth is associated with obstructive sleep, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome at later age. So, you know, just looking at these rec this research right here by um, Christian Giminal, who's also a leader in the field, I mean, this really is like groundbreaking research telling us that we really need to address these frenums as early as possible. You know, the earlier, the better for prevention. This is another study, ankyloglossia with deviation of the epiglottis and larynx. So this study here observed ankyloglossia to usually be accompanied by displacement of the epiglottis and the larynx. Infants with, the, with this disease develop dys, uh, dyspnea and skin and hair abnormalities. Other symptoms such as a frowning expression, uh, harsh respiratory sounds, hard crying, snoring, and frequent yawning were observed. Arterial oxygen percent saturation was also measured and revealed an unstable and slightly low saturated oxygen level. Signs and symptoms observed were similar to those in victims of sudden infant death syndrome, so SIDS before their death. So just correcting this ankyloglossia, okay, and deviation of the epiglottis and larynx resulted in greater improvement of these signs as well as stabilization and increase of saturated oxygen level. Now, despite, despite these abnormalities, they had been considered to be healthy by their pe pediatricians. Now, this is also an eye-opener. It's like, are we really looking for these restrictions? Are, you know, are we, uh, you know, spreading the news out more about these restrictions as much as we can. We really need to educate the public and just raise awareness about these restrictions because things like this can possibly be prevented if addressed as early as possible. Um, here's another study that shows breastfeeding and del deleterious oral habits in mouth and nose breathers. So, this right here shows that breastfeeding promotes several benefits in childhood among favoring the nasal breathing. I mean, Patrick, you're being the world leader in buteco breathing reeducation. I mean, I think you can agree with me on this one also. Mm. And in this study, the relationship between breathing pattern and the history of breastfeeding of del and of deleterious oral habits was determined. So mouth breathing children were breastfed for a shorter period of time and had a history of deleterious oral habits compared to nose breathers. So now the reason I even put this in here is because a lot of the times when we see 
um, these restrictions, such as the maxillary labial frenum restriction, where um, the upper lip looks, it's a little bit shorter, okay? And the person cannot possibly close their mouth. So it almost gives the appearance of having buck teeth. But in reality, the person cannot close their mouth. So they may develop habitual mouth breathing. And then we start seeing problems such as periodontal disease, gum disease, you know, um, all these inflammation. A lot of inflammation starts to occur in the oral cavity. I mean, not to mention there may also be a link between uh, mouth breathing and having enlarged tonsils, which also block the mm -hmm. airway, you know, but again, what came first, the chicken or the egg type yeah. of thing. But when we see these restrictions, this is also what we look at because when these, when they're babies, when a baby has a restricted maxillary frenum or even a lingual frenum restriction, these babies cannot latch on properly to the mom. And a lot of damage can occur over time because obviously the mom's not going to be able to breastfeed accordingly and then uh, resort to using a baby bottle or pacifier that can cause even, you know, other issues in there. Yeah. So this right here, I placed this picture here because um, breastfeeding difficulties may arise from these uh, restrictions. As you can see here, uh, normal tongue position during breastfeeding, the whole the tongue is completely making that suction, and the upper lip is flanging out, and there's everything is moving nice and smoothly during breastfeeding. But when you have these restrictions. Um, especially on the upper lip, the upper lip will not flange out accordingly and the tongue will not make that proper seal with the mother's breast. And then you can end up, you know, having a baby who's colicky uh, and, uh, you know, you, an abnormal swallow may develop just from this. Acid reflux may also develop from this. We also see mastitis uh, with a mom that can develop from these restrictions. And also, depression i mean not to mention just not just focusing on the mom but also on the dads because the dads have a lot to do with it as well you know they also get impacted by these restrictions when you have a baby that's crying 24 7 like this you know i mean myself included i had i had the same experience with my daughter i was unable to breastfeed because i thought that uh you know she was allergic to my breast milk as silly as that may sound but the whole time it was that she had a restricted labial frenum and a restricted lingual frenum. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, I didn't know about these things mm -hmm. back then. I wish I would have known this. It would have, uh, you know, stopped all that uh, crying and sleepless nights like that. But um, we also have to take a look at the uh, poor tongue posture that develops as a result of these uh, restrictions. Yeah. So there's a lot more that goes on here uh, think with these restrictions. Marta, I think what you're saying is absolutely huge. Um, if a child, if the, if the tongue, as, as you're aware, if the tongue is tied, the child isn't going to get the tongue up into the roof of the mouth. So the maxilla isn't going to form around the shape of the tongue. So the child then grows up with a very narrow maxilla, but also a very high palate, which is infringing their nasal cavity. And that's setting them up to be mouth breeders for possibly the rest of their life. We know 50% of kids up to 50% of studied children are going around with their mouths open. Mm -hmm. But the other thing about breastfeeding is that it's not just about the nutrition. The work of taking the milk from the breast will develop good muscle tone. And it exercises the muscles of the face to ensure that the, the child or the baby then can maintain nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is huge. And mm -hmm. I'm based in Ireland. There's no awareness of it here. Um, we had a little daughter. Nobody looked at her tongue tie. I kind of seen it, but I was kind of a little bit, you know, first time parent. I was a little bit afraid to go and do something about it. But then she started holding her breath during her sleep. Mm -hmm. So I was noticing her having obstructive sleep apnea. So we were able to spot it early on. We had the tongue tie and we had the lip tie addressed. Um, but a lot of parents won't have this information. And I think it's like, really, this should be, this is a major public health concern and it should be addressed at a governmental level and it's not so it's really up to parents I think you know to just to keep an eye and if the, if the baby is not thriving and if there is difficulty breastfeeding if the baby is chomping on the mother as opposed to being able to take express the milk 
um, I really think that the tongue tie should be, should be looked at early on. Absolutely. I agree 100% with you, Patrick. And, you know, uh, again, I wish I would have been uh, educated about this when both my children were actually born because I had the same issue with both my kids. Yeah. You know? And uh, who knew that uh, these things could also be hereditary? Yes. And, and who knows the impact? You know, the simplest of things. When I was in Bordeaux, we were at a sleep conference and one of the speakers talked about in the 16th century in France, midwives had an extra long fingernail. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose was if they, if they seen as soon as the baby was born, within the first minutes, check the tongue and clip the tongue tie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was ancient wisdom and wisdom that we have lost along the way. But of course, if the baby wasn't able to breastfeed back in the 16th century, it probably wouldn't survive. So I think it was a matter of life and death. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and thank goodness we have all these wonderful researchers now that are coming up and doing all this wonderful research uh, so that we can share all this with the public and just raise more awareness because, like you said before, this has become a major public health uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, we're seeing obstructive sleep apnea, like, yep. you know, everywhere, pretty much. It's, yes. You know, and it's it's something that, you know, as simple as these restrictions that can be addressed as early, you know, as yep. infancy. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is also, again, another study that was made that showed that the upper lip frenum as a predictive marker for unexpected and unexplained asphyxia in infants. So the objective of, the, of this study was to determine if there, I'm uh, sorry, there's a little typo there. <laughs> if there is a relationship between restricted upper lip frenum, so the upper lip ties, and unexpected and unexplained asphyxia in infants. Now, tongue ties and upper lip ties have been shown to significantly interfere with an infant's ability to breastfeed, like we had mentioned before. And uh, this study actually concluded that there is a very strong correlation between having a restricted upper lip frenum and infant death. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, this is, uh, you know, this is again another eye opener and more research that, uh, you know, that's to come, you know, from all of these uh, restrictions and issues that are facing today's society, you know. So um, I think this is also an important research to take a look at. And here, this is actually a slide that's courtesy of the Academy of Oral Facial Myofunctional Therapy, who trains medical and dental professionals about myofunctional disorders and how to do myofunctional therapy. But here, if you can see where it says tongue tie, on the upper corner, it says before, embryological remnant of tissue or aponeurosis of the genioglossus muscle in the midline between the undersurface of the tongue and the floor of the mouth that restricts tongue movement. Again, restricts tongue movement. Mm -hmm. Ankyloglossia is severely restricted tongue tie. It's a severely restricted tongue tie, okay? Now, we usually um, see patients with these tongue ties for myofunctional therapy. And if you can see in the middle slide, it says here, after. So the myofunctional therapist has been trained to assess the tongue and develop normal tongue functions. If there is a restricted lingual frenum or tongue tie, the myofunctional therapist will refer the patient to the proper doctor who will release the restriction surgically. And immediately following the procedure, the myofunctional therapist will repattern the tongue muscles to assure maximum benefit of the, from the procedure. So we work in a multidisciplinary approach. We work with various medical and dental professionals, all to make sure that we're uh, taking care of each specific patient with their specific needs. And these restrictions are important to address. Now, if you see here, if untreated, if the tongue is not able to function normally, the growth and development of the somatognathic system is compromised. This may affect digestion, speech, breathing, dental occlusion, TMJ function, posture, sleep disordered breathing, and chronic pain patterns of the head and neck. So this yeah. is huge, yes. you know? It's huge. Now, mm -hmm. if you take a look also at the lip tie, you know, as we mentioned before, a lip tie, also called the restricted labial or buccal frenum, is an embryologic remnant of tissue, also called midline deficiency, which may restrict normal lip function. And a lot of this plays an important role with the swallowing, the chewing, 
and uh, other, you know, the craniofacial development. So after uh, my, uh, if you take a look at the picture that says after, the ORF, o OMT or oral facial myofunctional therapist has been trained to develop a lip steel, which is critical and habituate proper function of the orbicularis oris muscle, which is the muscle around the lips, okay, and perioral muscles. If the patient presents with lip tight after attempts to stretch the tissue on su are unsuccessful, normal functions are restricted and the therapist will refer the patient to have the restriction removed. Immediately following the procedure, the therapist will repattern the muscles and function. So, it is important to follow through with myofunctional therapy and post-vernectomy exercises. And we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, but um, it is important to follow through with that after the vernectomies. And then again, if left untreated, an untreated short upper lip may create an open mouth at rest position where malocclusion or crooked teeth and periodontal disease are more likely to develop. So that habitual mouth breathing, again, increases the inflammation, uh, not just in the oral cavity, but I also believe in the body. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what your uh, uh, professional opinion on that is, uh, Patrick, but I think that, you know, a lot of the stuff that begins in the oral cavity can also, you know, trickle down, like have a, some sort of yes. a cascading effect. Yeah, yeah. Like just the, the, the amount of evidence showing that, he, like, mouth breathing, how it's affecting forward head posture, because, of course, the jaws aren't developing fully, that there's no space for the tongue. The individual is trying to get the tongue out of the airway, so they push their head forward, but this then is putting pressure on the spine. There may be a relationship with, with TMJ issues. Um, forward head posture, there's reduced respiratory muscle strength. It, 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 you know, the list is endless, um, but the main things that we're looking at is reduced quality of life. Yeah. Here is something that is so easily addressed and it's a very minor procedure and by doing so you can improve your child's quality of life and you know how many people must be going around there as adults and they're presenting with a myriad of different symptoms different conditions and they're going from doctor to doctor and they're looking for treatment and could it be possibly that some of them are related to that a tongue tie that there's some relationship there you know I think we, we really need to do a lot. There has to be a lot more research in it, but most certainly there has to be more awareness of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then here is another thing that we also see um, due to these restrictions. You know, if you develop that open mouth posture because you can't keep your lips closed, properly sealed, because there's a restriction on the upper lip or on the tongue, you see all these craniofacial changes. And this is what we mainly see with our patients as well. You start to see the tired eyes, you know, mm -hmm. poor definition of the cheekbones, narrow face, so the long narrow face syndrome, um, crooked teeth, the setback jaw, so the chin becomes protruded, smaller airways, yeah. and even a crooked nose as a result. There's so many different changes that can happen over time. You know, yeah. that's why addressing it as early as possible is critical. Yep, yeah. um, yep. Yeah. I mean, and this is, uh, this is uh, one of your slides, actually, <laughs> from uh, one, one of the books, right? Yeah, but, yeah, um, no, it is. And um, we had this commission because this is typically what we see with mouth breathing. I have some of them. I have the bent nose, the jaws that are set back, the high palate, the crooked teeth. I'm wearing brackets and braces at 43. I had sleep apnea, had breathing problems, rhinitis. One nostril is smaller than the other, deviated septum. And again, you know, I would stem and I have a tongue tie. Mm. So it's hereditary. Of course, my daughter had it. So, mm. you know, that's just one of those things. <laughs> I know. Um, so these restrictions can also lead to myofunctional or facial myofunctional disorders. So oral facial myofunctional disorders are disorders pertaining to the face and mouth and may affect directly and indirectly chewing, swallowing, speech, occlusion, Temporal mandibular joint movement, oral hygiene, stability of orthodontic treatment, facial aesthetic and facial skeletal growth. So these are just a few examples of the disorders that, uh, you know, develop as yeah. a result of these restrictions. And yeah. these are the, um, you know, the things that really should be addressed as early as possible. And I think, Marta, the middle photograph there is very pertinent because we're looking at a gothic arch. Mm -hmm. 
And we're looking at a very high pallet. And you can see literally how high that pallet is because the tongue, of course, wasn't resting in the roof of the mouth to shape, to shape the top jaw. And then the, the, the mandible, the lower jaw, is going to follow the top jaw. So here we have an instance of a Gothic arch. And ideally, we're looking for a Roman arch mm -hmm. because the top jaw should be the shape of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even from the whole basis, aesthetics, functionality, and cost. How much money do parents have to pay to get orthodontic treatment? Mm -hmm. And there's another aspect of that is that unless mouth breathing is addressed, there's a reasonably high chance of relapse that mm -hmm. the teeth will come back in over time. Mm -hmm. We have to address the frenum to get the tongue into the roof of the mouth. And it's the tongue that will maintain stability of the top jaw. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, unfortunately, that's um, a lot of the cases that we see is a relapse of orthodontic treatment and yeah. uh, as a result of these restrictions. Yes. But, you know, I mean, we really need to address the mouth breathing as well, especially if it's become, you know, habitual. Because yeah, that, it's all tied again, in. Yeah. It's all together. Exactly. So this was actually uh, taken from uh, the book, again, Tongue Tie Morphogenesis Impact Assessment and Treatment by uh, Allison Hazelbaker. So here you can see that tongue-tied individuals do not have tongue tip to anus progressive contractions. So you're gonna end, you can end up seeing sluggish digestion, GI tract inflammation, gas bloating, poor nutrient absorption, poor elimination, colic, leaky gut syndrome, and even constipation as a result of these restrictions um, because digestion begins in the tip of the tongue. So if the tip of the tongue is restricted, such as in a restricted lingual frenum case, the person's not going to be able to properly make that bolus with the food so that they can properly swallow it. And then they may also end up swallowing air. You know, it, there's... Yeah. Aerophasia. Yeah. yeah. So these are some of the consequences that we can see as uh, some of these restrictions as well. Okay. So <laughs> we also see speech misarticulations. I mean, if the if the tongue is restricted and cannot be elevated to do specific sounds, as you can see in the picture here, the animated teeth. Um, the tongue has to actually move to different parts of the mouth to make different sounds. Now, I'm not a speech therapist or a speech pathologist, but um, we see a lot of speech misarticulation problems that need to be addressed also as a result of these restrictions. So, you know, having uh, the tongue, it, you know, go into the roof of the mouth when producing certain sounds is critical. And a lot of the times these uh, patients cannot elevate their tongue to make these proper sounds. And then that decreases their self-esteem and it, it just creates a lot of like emotional um, challenges as well as a result of these restrictions. Here's another research um, that shows that um, supporting the benefits of phrenectomies. So in order to address these restrictions, um, a patient must undergo what's called a phrenectomy, which it's a minor surgical uh, procedure to just... Uh, you know, release the frenums. So in this uh, um, research, it states that breastfeeding improvement following tongue tie and lip release, uh, this was a cohort study. So investigation aimed to determine the impact of surgical tongue tie or lip tie release on breastfeeding impairment. The surgical release of tongue tie or lip tie results in significant improvement in breastfeeding outcomes. So this was great. Um, improvements occur early, one week postoperatively, and continue to improve throughout one month postoperatively. And the study identified a previously underrecognized patient population that may benefit from surgical intervention if abnormal breastfeeding symptoms exist. So this is also another study showing that, hey, um, after you have a phrenectomy, the breastfeeding improves. So this is something... Uh, you know, critical to take a look at also for those parents out there trying to breastfeed. And, uh, you know, there's just a myriad of benefits among, you know, uh, with breastfeeding, you know, I mean, the list is endless. Yeah. But, you know, this shows you that there are some benefits from getting these phrenectomies done. Yeah. 
So this is another study here, the lingual frenulum changes after phrenectomy. So this study aimed to describe the changes after phrenectomy concerning mobility and function of the tongue. 30 days after surgery, the subjects had the shape of the tip of the tongue and its movements improved. Lip closure and speech also improved. Phrenectomy is efficient to improve tongue posture, tongue mobility, oral functions, and oral communication. Now, it's also important to follow through with post phrenectomy exercises like I had mentioned before, uh, such as like myofunctional therapy, for example. We, um, as myofunctional therapists, we deal with uh, these, uh, you know, after the, after the patient has had a phrenectomy done, we can do certain exercises to help uh, maintain, uh, you know, the, the frenum nice and uh, flexible and improve the tongue posture. Um, it incre helps increase uh, muscle strength. It provides kinesthetic awareness to do, uh, you know, these post phrenectomy exercises improves articulation. It also helps to improve the motor function, again, of the tongue. And most important of all, it also increases the self-esteem of the patient because mm -hmm. now they're able to make these certain sounds that they were never able to do before mm -hmm. and do certain things with their tongue, you know, um, such as uh, increase their, uh, you know, the way that they uh, make, the, the way that they swallow a lot more efficient. And uh, there's just a lot of benefits towards uh, following through with the post phrenectomy exercises of, you know, mm -hmm. after having a lingual uh, or labial phrenectomy done. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the benefits again of myofunctional therapy and buteyko breathing reeducation post phrenectomy because these two go hand in hand. Um, myofunctional therapy is what's called neuromuscular reeducation that's used to correct the improper function of the tongue and facial muscles that are used at rest for chewing and for swallowing. So these are just some of the benefits that myofunctional therapy provides. So it aids in correction of tongue thrust, promotes a lip seal, promotes a lingual palatal resting posture, facilitates nasal breathing, promotes a posterior teeth together swallowing, facilitates bilateral chewing, facilitates correct drinking, eliminates negative oral habits. Uh, it aids with TMD or jaw pain and aids with decreasing the severity of sleep apnea as well. But it's also important that, you know, we follow through with myofunctional therapy to help um, provide uh, more, you know, again, increase the muscle strength of the tongue because there's eight muscles in the tongue. So if those muscles haven't been used properly, you know, you have to really kind of like rehabilitate the tongue after the phrenectomies. So we also uh, follow through with buteyko breathing reeducation because in most cases we have that open mouth resting yeah. posture, the habitual yeah. mouth breathing, and this helps to address the mouth breathing as well. So establishes that proper nasal breathing with the patient. So I mean, Patrick, you have written several books on buteyko breathing reeducation, right? With your latest book titled "The Oxygen Advantage," which is excellent. And it's actually a must read because it has a lot of these buteyko breathing uh, exercises mm -hmm. in it as well. But I think that both buteyko breathing reeducation and myofunctional therapy are critical to follow through after these phrenectomies yeah. when yes. trying, to, yeah. trying to address these problems. So, um, you know, I find the uh, dire need of uh, following through with both these uh, therapies combined. And um, again, you know, I have placed, I have put um, the butacoclinic.com website here because there's also a lot of information that you have on your website, Patrick, right? That can educate, you know, the public about this and uh, just provide yes. a little more awareness. Yeah, I think, Marta, that's really what it's about. And that's the whole purpose of us doing the podcast because the information needs to get out there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of ironic that both of us had personal experiences personally and also with our children mm -hmm. and that gives us to drive and i often see that with individuals it's something that you, you it affects you personally and then you really want to try and get the information out there so what we did was we put a lot of papers together looking at the relationship between mouth breathing and say academic achievement mouth breathing and forward head posture mouth breathing and asthma it really ties in it all ties in with my functional therapy you know it's 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 such a Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it also, um, it all ties in with myofunctional therapy. Um, I think we lost Patrick there for a little bit. Patrick is actually in Ireland and we are here in New York. So uh, there's a, you know, a time difference and uh, looks like there's some internet problems going on. But like, just reiterating what Patrick was saying is that um, following through with the Buteco breathing re-education and myofunctional therapy, you know, it's essential. And it's important to be able to spread the word out to the public and raise awareness because this has become a major public health issue. And, um, you know, just raising awareness can help so many people out there. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. And um, stay tuned for more videos to come.